Hi, everybody. Welcome into the House of Sparky, special edition Zoom from all over the country, end of year celebration. I say a celebration, it's also a competition because I'm, I'm celebrating the fact that I get to see four beautiful faces on our Zoom chat here. Sebastian Emanuel, Andrew Bell, Jacob Rosenfarb, and Madden Johnstone Thomas. Gang, you'll have your time to introduce yourselves and talk some trash, but first, let's go over really what this is because I know that it's kind of an interesting thing that we're doing today. It's a bit of a competition. It is a celebration of what ASU Athletics did so great this year, but we're also breaking down everything that was going on in a bit of a fun conversation style deal. So you can see it says J-A-M-S. It doesn't just mean that I love jam, which I do, peanut butter and jelly and jam. It spells jams, which is fantastic. But what it really is, Jacob, Andrew, Madden, Sebastian, we're going to be scoring points, kind of around the horn style for when we're doing our discussions, whoever has the most points at the end. Andrew, what do they win? Uh, they win their rant, Scotty. So if you've ever seen Around the Horn, they get their 30 seconds of fame. They can talk about whatever they want. If they want to talk about something ASU-related, just a rant about something going on, um, they have the mic. They have center stage. Hey, literally looking forward to this. Not only are we going to be right here, but also we've got our House of Sparky reporters from all over the place that will be chiming in and breaking down some of the smaller sports and great things and great moments that ASU did this season. We also have the top five plays, top five moments of the entire 2019-2020 school year. Yes, we know that it got cut short, but there were still fantastic moments and memories that happened this year. So a breakdown. You heard Andrew Bell speak. He's a Fantastic, fantastic human being. What a, what a beautiful voice. Looking forward to that. Sebastian, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. How are you, my friend? I'm pretty good. You know, I haven't been up this early in a few weeks, so this is oh, something new. You're in Orlando, did you say? So this is, this is at, like nighttime for you, basically. Basically, basically, yeah. Just chilling in Orlando, Florida. Can't complain. It's a little rainy today, but uh, yeah, we'll persevere. Hey, some inside scoop for everybody, for those who follow House of Sparky. Madden is, is my next door neighbor in Phoenix, but she decided to leave because she didn't want to quarantine next to me and my roommate, Noah Lau, who's also a part of House of Sparky. So Madden, you're in Las Vegas. How are you? It's great to see you and talk to you again. Good to see you too, Scotty. Um, I'm good. I actually got up and went for a run this morning already, worked out, showered, so I'm ready. <laughs> All right, let's go. Let's go. Hey, a, a break down <laughs> again of what this is. It's, it's good answers will earn you points. I'm in charge of that. I am kind of the ringmaster when it comes to points. Everybody has a color, right? You see that? It was green, blue, pink, and orange. Is this green or yellow? We'll, we'll go with green. And of course, JAMS, it's for everybody, and we go points down. This is not a who can speak faster or louder or who has a a stronger more passionate argument this is going to be organized i'm in charge of saying hey andrew you're done madden what do you think about this if if i don't like your answer andrew um then you're done and i'm going to stop you right away it's not andrew's talking and sebastian goes no 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 that's not what we're doing here today. we're we're going to be organized we're going to have fun we're all buddies no feelings are going to be hurt at least for the most part um and for that, we're going to start with ASU football, but first we'll take a short break and get right back into the action uh, with a quick House of Sparky note. Sunnival fans, we can't thank you enough of your continued support from all of us at House of Sparky. I hope that you have a safe and healthy summer. And make sure to stay tuned at House of Sparky on Twitter and HouseofSparky.com for all updates regarding the fall 2020 season. And hey, we hope to see you there on the other side. Thank you so much and have a great summer. So it's officially that time to, to begin our competition. Our friendly competition, that is. You see Sebastian Emanuel, Andrew Bell, Jacob Rosenfarb, Madden Johnstone Thomas, four reporters for HouseOfSparky.com. My name's Scotty Gange. So happy to be leading the discussion. You've heard most of my voice for this because now it's up to the four of you guys to start. And I'm going to begin, let's start with Jacob because it's the latest in the day for you. We're going to break down fall sports for ASU, specifically ASU football. And we're just going to start with a bit of reflection. Jacob, did ASU football succeed or fail this season? Ooh, I would go I'd go a slight succeed. I think if we're looking at it from the start of the season, I think they overachieved. But you have to preface that with saying that they had such a hot start, including that win at Michigan State, that expectations got so high. And in that middle of the season, lull kind of, you know, came crashing back down to earth. So it's, it's a mixed bag for sure. But I'm going to say overall a success. Overall a success. Andrew, how about you? I'm going to contrast Jacob a little bit. I think if you were to tell me at the beginning of the year that ASU would have eight wins and a bowl victory, I'd say that's a success. But um, based on how the season kind of played out and where they started, I'm going to say it was a failure. and Kind of just the four-game losing streak, I'd say that's the biggest thing that comes to mind. Um, if you think about where this team could be if they beat 
um, USC, Oregon State, Colorado, and then of course the disappointment in uh, Pasadena against UCLA. Um, I think if this team could have been in a really good position to possibly take a run at the Pac-12 South. Um, but with that being said, I think there's individual successes, but overall, um, just that losing streak that comes to mind, you think kind of what could have been, but it's kind of why it was such a young football team and kind of the ups and downs of season. But I'm gonna go with the uh, failure, just as a, as well, a failure. Now, do we have a success and a failure? ASU won a bowl game, they beat Oregon in Tempe. What do you see this season as? There's a lot of people that thought they could have done better. I personally think that perhaps they could have done better, but that doesn't matter. What do you think, Madden? Um, I personally think it was a, it, a success, um, you know, the second year under Herm Edwards, they went to their second straight bowl game and this year they actually won. Um, they had those big wins over Oregon and then Michigan State. And we have to look at that, Jaden Daniels is still a freshman, it's his first year, so we still have three more years with him, so I think it definitely was a success for them. Seb, we'll, we'll transition to that uh, quickly, success or failure, but also, like Matt and said, Jaden Daniels, a freshman, he is now a superstar. A lot of people have him as a top five quarterback in the NCAA coming into next year behind big names like Trevor Lawrence uh, and Justin Fields. They have Marvin Lewis as a defensive coordinator alongside Antonio Pierce. A lot of guys are returning. They did just lose a first round pick uh, in wide receiver Brandon Ayuk, but it seems like a resurgence of a team led by a stud quarterback. Are the expectations too high for next season? It, it's tough. I, it's weird because uh, I want to base this season as a success. Um, with this upcoming year, Jaden has talked about, I mean, you saw some of his tweets last night. He's saying, hey guys, come play with me. Uh, he's getting all these freshman wide receivers. He's got freshman running back now. So he's kind of being the team leader, as you said. Um, the defense, they didn't lose much. Kobe Williams was that star. The linebackers a little bit, but they're getting Merlin and Darian Butler back. Uh, their defensive line is going to be new. They have uh, Coach Rodriguez from the Minnesota Vikings, so that's going to be huge for them. Um, Marvin Lewis coming in, him and Herm are just best friends. They, they know how they're going to work. Um, the rest of the team, I think they can compete for the South. USC's kind of been a little struggling. It's weird to kind of figure them out. And I looked at ASU schedule. I think they can win nine or 10 games, and I wouldn't be surprised if they do that. Nine or 10 games. Andrew, you said the season was a failure. How about next year? Are they the team to beat in the Pac-12 South? Just then to clarify, Sky, just because I said, you know, it was a failure, doesn't mean that I don't think it was a good season. Overall, I think it was a Are you backtracking what you're saying? No, I'm just saying, you know, there's individual successes, but there was Overall, when you consider the four-game losing streak, that was a failure. Uh, got to see that hand pull away, Scotty. It's a good thing. <laughs> um, but going into next year, I think there's such high expectations uh, with this team, so much more elevated expectations. And um, Seb already mentioned it, both Marvin Lewis. I think the defense is going to be in a really good position, and they're playing more of a more traditional style next year. Of course, Danny Gonzalez had the 3-3-5 system where they had a Tillman safety. Um, next year, they're going to more of a 4-3 defensive front. They get Tyler Johnson back. And I think the defense is really going to step up next year. And then you have returners in the secondary, um, like Ashari Crosswell, Chase Lucas is back, Jack Jones after having a year under his belt in the season where um, he, you know, didn't even really get a full training camp. He's really kind of just going at it, um, off the, coming in off the street and playing right away in the middle of the season. So I think the defense, everyone talks about Jaden Daniels and company, but I think the defense is really poised to have a breakout year next year as well. So um, I'd agree with those high expectations, probably go nine or 10 wins and I'm um, a serious contender for the Pac-12 South. You said everybody talks about the Jaden Daniels and company, but we really haven't talked about much of them in this show so far. Jacob, Zach Hill is coming in to be the new offensive coordinator for ASU. He did great things at uh, Boise State. Jaden Daniels is fantastic. Led ASU to beat Justin Herbert and, and the Oregon Ducks, a top team in the country, near the end of the season last year. Won a bowl game, too. The offense next year, what can we expect on that end? I think the offense next year is going to be revolutionized under Zach Hill. I think the biggest change ASU is going to make is in the offensive line. So much of their so much of their failure, sorry, last year hinged on the fact that they were starting a 17-year-old left tackle and a 18 or 19-year-old right guard in Donovan West. And Ladarius Henderson was that 17-year-old. I think having more stability, the transfer of Texas A&M left tackle Kellen Deesh is going to make a big difference in terms of stabilizing the entire offensive line. Another year for Ladarius Henderson. Another near year for Donovan West. I think that is going to revolutionize what the ASU offensively can do. Madden, Eno Benjamin is in the draft. He'll be picked in the next couple of days. Brandon Ayuk, for reference to those watching right now, was was chosen number 25 last night. They lost two of their biggest playmakers. Nikhil Harry is long gone. Frank Darby is leading the wide receiver core, I guess. 
does Jaden Daniels have enough weapons? Um, yeah, that's something I kind of been thinking about, you know, losing Eno, losing Brandon. I think they do have enough success for Frank Darby to kind of step up and run the offense with Jaden Daniels, but it's going to be hard for them to kind of fill the role of Eno, I think, personally. But I think Frank Darby will definitely step up. I think so, too. I think Frank Darby, not only is a great player, but he's fun to watch, too. I think uh, if you guys saw his tweet last night, he's determined to go the third year in a row for ASU first round draft pick wide receivers, which, hey, that would be fun to see if it really does happen. Um, Andrew, let's go with you. We, we mentioned Eno and Ayuk are gone. Of course, Nikhil Harry's long gone, drafted in the first round last year. With those two guys going to the NFL, what do you expect to see out of them in their uh, short-term careers in the next couple of years in the league? Uh, I think just in the National Football League, when you think about those two guys, I think a guy who um, obviously, you know, is kind of still up in the air at this point. We're awaiting his draft decision and um, kind of who will pick him over the next coming days. But Braden Ayuk, I think, fits into a great system in San Francisco. And Scotty, I remember sitting with you in late September. We were freezing our butts off in Berkeley at Memorial Stadium talking about um, Braden Ayuk and kind of the changes that he made going into this year and stepping in for Nikhil Harry. And uh, I think what really helps him at the next level um, is, you know, he has all the intangibles with his wingspan, his 40 time, um, but I think it's his ability to be coachable. And, um, you know, he really went into the film room last year with Derek Hagan. I remember him in an interview at the beginning of the year, him mentioning that um, just how much he spent time in the film room, adjusting his route running, becoming a better route runner. And that's going to pay big dividends uh, in the NFL. And then you look at Kyle Shanahan, um, you know, his, you know, his wide receivers that he's developed, Julio Jones, Andre Johnson, I mean, down the list, Debo Samuel's probably a, a Super Bowl MVP if it's not for Patrick Mahomes, who, by the way, won a Super Bowl but couldn't beat Arizona State. Um, but, yeah, I think, um, you know, Brandon Ike's poised to do big things. I think Eno can slot in um, helping a team. I don't think he'll be a number one running back right away, but I think he can come in and help kind of in a backup role and really take a load off of maybe a, uh, you know, first string running back somewhere in the league. So I think teams will be looking out for that as well. Said before we toss it to Ryan McClure to get a breakdown of one of the biggest wins for ASU this season, how about the class coming in? We've got names like uh, Diamante Triano, if I said that correctly, I hope I did. Great running backs coming in, a whole lot of California kids. Who is the player to watch do you think that can make an immediate impact as a freshman for ASU next season? I think you got it right there. Train him in uh, Nagata as well is the other running back. Both freshmen, it's going to be huge um, taking that load off of what Eno was doing the past couple of years. So it's going to be cool to kind of see a two-way system with how Zach Hill runs his offense like he did at BSU. And I think the ones that you got to watch are just all those freshman wide receivers. Who is Jaden going to go after? Who is he going to throw the ball to? He's got so many choices. And how many of them are ready to possibly kind of sit in a role of taking some time like a curly and kind of wait your games of when are you going to make that uh, outbreak game? All right. Hey, guys, a celebration. This is what this is. Not only are we breaking things down, looking forward to the rest of it. These are the scores right now. And so, we're, Andrew, you, you are winning, but you've had the most time to talk. And so I'm going to change it up. I said you'd get 30 seconds to, to go. But, Matt, and I'm going to give it to you because I feel like I was the least fair and you had the least amount of time to talk uh, about ASU football. So I'd like to open it up to you. Anything on the terms of ASU football, whether it be Herm, whether it be the crowd, wh whatever your thoughts might be, what you might most be looking forward to, 30 seconds of whatever you want ASU football discussion, Matt. Uh, well, I'm obviously going to go with Herm just because I think he's doing great things with the ASU football program um, in his first two years. And we still have a lot to come from him. And so I think he does well supporting his players. We saw him last night on Twitter. He sent Brandon a video um, on Twitter and had his 49ers hat. So I think he's doing a lot with the recruiting, obviously, bringing in those big recruits from California and everything. So I think we still have a lot to see from him, and I'm excited to see what he does with the program for the next couple of years. A breakdown here. Uh, Jacob, three. Andrew is winning right now with, what is that, five points? Probably because he's been talking the most so far. Madden with three, and Seb with three as well. So, so Andrew, you are going to be a little bit ice cold here We're gonna because you have a special segment on ASU hockey. But first, we got to touch ASU basketball. We're going with the big guns here. Bobby Hurley led ASU to what looked like to be the third straight season going to the NCAA tournament. Madden, we'll start with you, I guess. This season as a whole, it was a roller coaster year. ASU had lost by 40 points to St. Mary's at one point. Everybody said, this team is, is just not it. And then they come and they win, what, seven straight games in Pac-12 play, turn the season around. How would you just, in, in, like, from straight up, 
grade this season for ASU? Um, I'm going to give it a B plus. Like you said, they kind of struggled in the beginning. They had that loss to St. Mary's, but then they went on that seven game winning streak. So I think that kind of turned things around for them. Um, kind of showed them that they are able to do this. They had that big win against U of A in Tempe. Um, so I think that was really big for them. And I think they were really excited for this Pac-12 tournament. And I think they would have done really well and then got ready for the NCAA tournament. You guys are setting me up just perfectly. You, you mentioned the, the Pac-12 tournament, Matt, and it makes it so easy. Okay, Jacob, in the Pac-12 tournament, what do you think we would have seen from ASU if we were fortunate enough to get to watch it? I think it's, it's going to crush ASU fans everywhere, but I think they at least would have made the championship game, and they, I think they would have had a real shot at winning it. I think <clears throat> ASU was set. Their first game of the tournament was going to come with only five teams remaining the way it's set up, so they had a relatively easy path to the, to the championship. They didn't have Arizona in their, on their side of the bracket. They didn't have USC on their side of the bracket. They didn't have Oregon on their side of the bracket, and Colorado had already lost. So, I mean, their path was about as easy as you can ask for and that would have just kind of cemented everything that this season had been about for ASU. It would have been a season of resiliency, a season of comebacks, a season that, like you said, started with such a horrific 40-point loss, and then to be able to work all the way back and the, to be able to be on the verge of a tournament appearance is honestly mind-boggling. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's crushing to lose out on that on the Pac-12 tournament for sure. Before, the, before we, we began this recorded segment, everyone said, dang, Jacob, this is your wheelhouse, man. This is where you come back. I'm going to give you another point. What a fantastic answer. Jacob, you're now in the lead. It's, I'm going to come back to you a few more times. But right at the end, you mentioned they were on the verge of greatness, right? And Verge was a big name for ASU this year. And Alonzo Verge, a sixth man of the year in Pac-12 play. He's one of the few returners next year with Remy Martin and Romello White right now, supposedly not going to be coming back. And so, Seb, I toss this to you. Alonzo Verge coming back, being the returner. What does he have to do next year for ASU to be a top team in the Pac-12? Well, he's going to be a scorer no matter what. That's what he came in to do. That's, that's his job. Um, I, it's going to be interesting to see how he plays with Christopher. I don't know if Christopher is going to want the ball more. How's Bagley going to want this? Um, I think Verge is going to become more of a passer. We're going to be surprised by what he does. Um, and I'm not going to be surprised. I do think Remy comes back. Um, there's just too many guards that are in this draft. And I personally didn't think he was the best in the Pac-12. I'm a Peyton Pritchard fan. I thought he was the best in the best in the conference. I was excited to watch him versus Remy in the Pac-12 championship. I drove with Jacob there. I was going to be a fan. Uh, and then we got stuck. <laughs> and, you know, I was I was in the MGM. I was looking for Peyton Pritchard, man. That's, that's my guy. So I'm just going to be honest and say that ASU was going to lose in the championship game. And I'll give that season a B-. Jacob, I want to go to you here. He, he said that that he believes Remy Martin's coming back. But I know there's talk, hey, I don't even know if he's gonna try to go to the NBA. He might try to go play in the Philippines and represent his country. That's a possibility or go somewhere overseas if the NBA doesn't work out. Let's suppose here that Remy Martin is not on the team next year, does not come back. He goes forward with professional basketball, wherever it may be. What is his legacy as a Sun Devil? I think Remy Martin's transition from scrappy six-man freshman to now face of the program as a junior, I think is a testament to the greatness of Bobby Hurley. I think the relationship the two forged and the and the ability of Hurley to kind of give all these messages and kind of transmit this, what it means to be a point guard to Remy. You've seen that across his time at ASU. You've seen him grow as a leader. You've seen him grow as a facilitator. He came into ASU as kind of a score first point guard and he's leaving as as a team first, he's going to put everything above his score. He's going to get everyone else involved, and then he'll worry about himself. And I think, like I said, I think that's a testament to what Bobby Hurley has done. Very interesting. Um, Madden, Bobby Hurley, the day that the NCAA tournament was canceled, tweeted out, hey, on Selection Sunday, NCAA, you guys should at least announce the teams that made the tournament. Do that for the kids. And I was kind of thinking to myself, Maybe he's doing that for himself, too. You have to believe Bobby Hurley wanted to bring ASU to three straight NCAA tournaments and be a legend in that sense for ASU basketball and the history that hasn't been so kind. Bobby Hurley, what would you see as him being successful next year in a couple years as he's already been pretty successful as the ASU head coach? Well, I think it's just continuing to go to those NCAA tournaments. Um, starting to win Pac-12 championships. I mean, he's bringing in these recruits like Josh Christopher, um, Marcus Bagley as well. So I think just bringing in 
bigger and bigger recruits and building this program so that they are able to compete around the entire Pac-12 and even eventually, hopefully, win an NCAA tournament. Andrew, I never said that this would be a fair competition in, in this segment. It has not been. Everybody is, is caught up at least. Jacob is two points ahead. And so I open it up to you. I'll give you one that you could get pretty good points on. We talked about it a little bit, but Josh Christopher specifically commits to ASU, the highest ranked recruit to ever commit to ASU, ranked higher than James Harden at the time. What does that mean for ASU basketball? Uh, it's a huge get for the program. I mean, um, and this was, it's so funny how, you know, perceptions change over a matter of weeks. Two weeks ago, Elias Valtonen, um, Khalid Thomas, both key figures off the bench for ASU, people who thought they were going to be a big part of this program moving forward. Um, you know, they both transfer for the program, out of the program. They go on the transfer portal, Andre Allen as well. People are thinking, what's going on with Bobby Hurley? He had this great season and suddenly he's losing these guys. Um, you never know what goes on behind closed doors. That's stuff that um, even, not even, you know, us who are around ASU basketball pretty frequently um, even know about, but maybe they knew that Josh Christopher and Marcus Bagley um, were both coming in. But it's so funny how that perception changes of these guys are coming out. What is wrong in Tempe? What is wrong with Bobby Hurley and his recruiting? Two weeks later, he lands Josh Christopher to play with Marcus Bagley. Things aren't looking so bad anymore. They get the highest rated recruit in program history, along with Holland Woods, of course, who transferred from Portland State as well. So, um, you know, two huge gets for the program. Um, and I think it's just a testament to the recruiting and the co or the caliber of recruits that are coming in and maybe some other guys um, who opted for the transfer portal are now seeking that route because they knew there was some uh, higher end talent coming in and the competition was going to get um, that much better. Andrew and Madden both have a special breakdown for us on different ASU athletics. So for the rest of this conversation, you guys are put on ice. Sebastian, I'll go to you and we'll close out with uh, Jacob before we move on to the next ASU sports. He mentioned Elias Feltonen left, Khalid left the program. They got a few guys coming in, big recruits. But I'm wondering for the Sun Devils who left the ASU basketball program, is that something that should be or could be worried about if you're an ASU fan seeing guys leave the program? Uh, I think it's interesting. Um, Bobby, we've noticed that he likes to use maybe seven players all in all. At the start of the season, he'll go 10, kind of see what's everything, uh, who are the players that he wants. I think it was a little interesting that they decided to leave, um, especially Elias being that shooter. I think he could have been much better this coming year. Um, but I, I don't know. It's so weird because I just saw a thing that basketball players are transferring just like it's like it's grade school. Like, you know, it's just such an easy thing that all these people are doing. And I don't, I don't blame them. They want to get playing time. That's kind of the thing. This could be their only chance of playing basketball for the rest of their career. So, I mean, I don't blame them. Um, Bobby does play small ball, so it was a little interesting to see some of those guys leave. Jacob, what do you think about that? Quickly. Yeah, I was I was honestly surprised about both of them, um, especially Valtanen. Um, earlier in the year, Valtanen seemed to kind of catch Bobby Hurley's eye. He was this defensive stalwart who could who had a nice outside shot against the Georgia team, who played extremely well against Anthony Edwards. And so there's kind of thought that Valtanen had cemented himself within the within the rotation. And then towards Pac-12 play, he just kind of fell out and never made his way back in. And Jake. so it, it's a shame to see them go, but but they, they really didn't have a place, which is the unfortunate part. Do you know what else didn't have a place? I was going to give you a point there, and the post-it note didn't stick and it fell. So that means you did not get that point. It, I don't make the rules. That's put in the rule of House of Sparky end of your celebration competition party um, with friends. We're going to make the name a little bit longer. So sucks to be Jacob in, in the orange scenario here um but hey that's the way it goes and that and i know you got to follow asu women's basketball all season long and it was a very very fun season we're going to toss it to house of sparky reporter eric ruby at the end of this specific segment to break down what is possibly the wackiest and wildest and most insane weekend for asu women's basketball in history but in, as an overview how would you rate and how did you see this season for charlie turner Thorne and her team I felt like it was kind of a roller coaster. You know, some games they would come out and they would do great, and then they would kind of choke at the end a little bit, if you would say, and then lose. And then other games they would come out and do great the whole time. So I feel like it was kind of a roller coaster. And then they had that tough first round loss in the Pac 12 tournament. Um, Charlie said that they were missing Kiara Russell, obviously, due to an injury. So she felt like they weren't really 100%. Um, but she, I talked to her last week, actually, and she had said that they had gone back in the gym, they got some rest and they were just getting ready for the NCAA tournament. She felt like they were ready to go. 
Um, they had six, they just signed six recruits actually. And when I talked to her last week, they said, or she said, stay tuned. So, and then the next day they had signed another recruit. So it's going to be another young team for them next year, actually. But she said that she's excited for that challenge. Stay tuned. Love that. Scotty, stay tuned. When you say stay tuned, we're talking about staying tuned for ASU hockey as well. And uh, you know, talking about the Sun Devil hockey program, as uh, if you give me a moment here after um, women's basketball, you know, talking about the ASU hockey season, um, that was a team that I got a chance to be out there every you know, media availability, every game, uh, things like that, last two seasons. And that's really a program that's really grown overnight somewhat. Uh, it started last year with Joey DeCord, um, you know, being an Ottawa Senders draft pick, going to the National Hockey League, being the first Sun Devil to play a game in the NHL. I um, actually got a chance to do a chat with him last week and do a QA. and a uh, And I think it says a lot about the program that he um, nearly came back for a senior season, given the fact that, um, you know, in the NHL, he had an option if he comes back, he becomes a free agent. Um, but if he goes to the NHL, then he's still under contract. So that's a big decision if you risk running a free agent um, or becoming a free agent. But he decided, um, you know, that he was going to go pro. But even last week, he was saying, I still wonder sometimes if it was the right decision. When you think about when there's that big of a decision, you still, I, I don't know, it's kind of up in the air. Um, that's pretty big. So. Um, for I think that says a lot about Coach Powers and then getting this year. I think there's a lot to look forward to with the program. Um, this season, they would have been on their way to a second straight NC2A tournament. And I'll say it now, I think next year's team has the best chance of making a run to the Frozen Four um, with some of the talent that they've acquired. They have a top five recruiting class coming in. They have a Wisconsin transfer and Sean Doogie, who um, led, the Wis or led Wisco in uh, scoring a few years ago. And then they have um, Willie Neerham and James Sanchez returning. Johnny Walker's back. Brinson Pashnuk is gone. Um, but the name I'd like to highlight the most and who you'll probably see on an NHL playing surface, uh, even Brinson Pashnuk said it earlier this year. He said he's looking forward to seeing him um, at the pro level. But it's the name of Josh Maniscalco. I think he's going to be one of the best players in the country next year. Um, can't confirm um, just from seeing around and, you know, having my eyes around the rink this year that um, there's NHL GMs looking at him. It's one thing to have scouts come out the game, but when you have a GM fly out, um, you know, to come watch a player play, um, that's you know, pretty big. So Josh Maniscalco, I'd say, another name to look forward to. But like I said, I think they're in a great position to make a deep run next year in the postseason. So, Andrew, I think, and, and for everybody, the theme of ASU winter sports right now, like Matt has said, is stay tuned. Andrew, you said that the Frozen Four is a possibility for ASU hockey next season in their winter, in their winter season. ASU women's basketball, Matt, and that was the words you exactly used, stay tuned. They've got a lot of exciting things happening. And Jacob and Seb, I know you guys really touched on it, but ASU basketball with Verge coming back, and uh, Bagley coming in, and most importantly, Josh Christopher coming in. It's going to be super, super exciting. And who knows, maybe Remy or Romello comes back to play. But for this show right now, in the House of Sparky, end of your celebration competition on Zoom with friends on the internet, having fun. I'm going to make the name longer every single time. That's what it is right now. Stay tuned, because my, I'm most excited for the lightning round, which is coming up right after this. But before that, a special breakdown from House of Sparky reporter Eric Ruby to break down what really happened in the greatest weekend in ASU women's basketball history. That's right, Scotty. One of the greatest weekends in ASU basketball history, both men's and women's, period. This was truly historic stuff that happened in Tempe. Just to give some perspective, ASU women's basketball beat the number two ranked and number three ranked team in Oregon and Oregon State, respectively, in consecutive games. A feat that has not happened by an unranked team in over 20 years. And if just for fun we want to throw ranked teams in there, hasn't happened in about a decade, 2010. Now, so it was needless to say that history was made in Tempe that weekend behind some key contributors like Jatavia Tapley, who had 16 and 14 in those games. Robbie Ryan, who led the way in the Oregon game with 17 points and a total team defensive effort where they held Oregon to 23 points under their average scoring margin and Oregon State to almost 30 points under their average scoring margin. It was overall just an incredible Incredible weekend of basketball. And yes, they weren't ranked going into that weekend, but you can bet your butt that they were ranked afterwards. So I'm not sure what was in the water in Tempe that week in January, but whatever it was, it sure led to history. Hi, everybody. Welcome back into supposedly Andrew's Wheelhouse. This is the House of Spark, the end of your celebration competition over Zoom with friends. They're all smiling uh, on the internet. The name keeps, keeps going longer and longer. I think it's funny. I don't know about you guys. Um, what this is, it's the most hectic 90 seconds in the history of HouseofSparky.com, everybody. It's the lightning round. We've talked about it before. Uh, we're still figuring out how exactly it's going to go. But basically what we're going to do 
I'll point to each sticky note. When I point to your sticky note, you have to answer the question. It's gonna be a whole bunch of questions, a whole lot of talk, 90 seconds will be on the clock. That was a rhyme, I didn't mean to make it rhyme, but it did, it sounded really good. Are we ready to go? Yes. Yes. Yes, all right, Madden, you said yes. I love the verbals, boom, point. That's um, Lightning room. No friends here anymore. You can heckle, you can jump in and say, no, that's wrong. I am for the most part gonna do it, but if you jump in, hey, lightning round, all goes, all right? 90 seconds will be on the clock. Ready, set, go. Will ASU baseball, or would they have made the NCAA tournament in Omaha? No, I don't think they would. Why? Uh, pitching depth wasn't good, or I mean, there was pitching depth, but too young. Torkelson, why would he have not played well in the NCAA tournament, apparently? It's just Torkelson. There's nothing else that helps him. There's eight other batters. Gage Workman's also on the team. Why would he not have done with that? Gage Workman, Trevor Hover, they all won a word with you, Seb. Do you agree? <laughs> What was that? Agree or disagree? Uh, deep lineup, like I said, pitching's everything in the World Series, so that's why. That's my my last answer. AS softball was a great offensive team this year. Would they have made the NCAA tournament? Yes, because they had the batters to do it. You agree? I agree with her 100%. All right, ASU hockey. Things didn't work out. Next year, what's going to happen? Are they going to win, or are they going to make the Frozen Four? Already said it. Yep, Frozen Four all the way. Why? Hot class of recruits coming in. There is ASU hockey on the up and up. ASU women's basketball, where are they going next year? Definitely going to be in the championship round of the Pac-12 tournament and hopefully Sweet 16 of the NCAA tournament. ASU swimming, do you know anything about them? Of course not. I follow Zach Keenan. <laughs> I follow the patterns. <laughs> ASU field hockey, this is in your wheelhouse. What can you tell us? Uh, field hockey, I'm directing that to Madden because she is the expert on that. I have uh, eight seconds. seconds. I wish I knew what field hockey was, but I think it's similar to lacrosse, which I know, so I'm not sure. One time, great lighting. Yeah, look at that dome. Fantastic. I don't think ASU women's or ASU field hockey has a team. They're club, aren't they? Yeah, that was a trick question. I thought you were gonna go with women's lax, and I was like, wait, this is a trick question. There's no field hockey. That's yeah. Fun to watch. But like, for Thanks great, for women's confusing lacrosse, the great women's lacrosse content, though, Madden had it all season. Terry Clayton had a great year. That's why I, when I thought it came out as Wims Across, that's why I was like, threw a change up there, Scotty. Threw me off. Hey, we're going to take a short break. I'm going to count up the points I created in my head, put them on the board. When we come back, you can see third place, second place, and first place. Sound good, gang? Sounds, Sounds good. good. Sounds good. Sad, that's another point for you going in at the end of the break. What a year for Arizona State swimming, especially after Grant House's announcement that he would be taking an Olympic red shirt for the 2019-2020 season. The men still flourished. Guys like Zach Pody with the fastest 100 backstroke time in Pac-12 history. The younger guys though, Jack Dolan, show that they can pick it up too. And the whole team in general with those sprint relays, they had five guys by mid-season going sub-20. And that was just such a great time for Arizona State swimming. On the women's side, it was just equally as good, if not better, with swimmers like Emma Nordine establishing herself as one of the fastest distance freestylers in the entire country. At Pac-12, she won the crown in the 500 freestyle and had the fastest 500 time in the country. We would love to see her at NCAA championships. With Sierra Rungi graduating and Chloe Islanta graduating, it seems like some holes will be left to fill, but younger swimmers like Jade Folsk have let those questions go completely answered, and we know that this team will have plenty to offer in the future in the coming years. On the men's side next year with Grant House returning to a team that's even stronger, he'll be able to establish himself as likely one of the fastest 200 freestylers in the country and in the NCAA. Really looking forward to next season. Hi everybody, welcome back into the House of Sparky. Uh, what is it? Celebration, end of year, competition, on Zoom, with friends, over the internet, having fun, smiling. It's just a great name, it really is. We, we wrote it down, this was, it was an easy name for us. You just heard from, <clears throat> you just heard from Zach Keenan uh, and Seb, I think it was you who mentioned, hey, I don't know much about ASU swimming, Zach Keenan does. Well, yes he does and you got to hear from him on what this season was for ASU Swim Squad. Uh, thank you, Zach. To that. And now, guys, it's officially time before we announce the top five moments of the year for Arizona State to announce our winners. So we're going to start with third place. And it actually, if I can do this just the right way, is a tie between Seb and Madden. So congratulations to you guys. Thank you. Oh, tie for third place. Let's get a round of applause. Now it's the moment we're all been waiting for. We have Jacob Rosenfarb and Andrew Bell. Jacob, remember, is the orange sticky notes. Andrew, remember, 
is the pink sticky notes. The story here is Andrew jumped ahead early and Jacob clawed his way back through ASU basketball discussion. It all came down to lightning round. And guys, you guys were tied going into, or no, you were not. Andrew was up by one going into the lightning round. You both had fantastic answers. Could Jacob have clawed his way back and found his way to tie for first or take it over? And the answer is you guys were exactly the same amount of points on the lightning round. The one point that changes it is Jacob's sticky note that fell to the ground. Would you believe it comes to that? In wow. Insane, incredible. I don't make this stuff up. This is all, I'm just getting the voice in my ear giving points. It's incredible. So, Andrew, you are the winner of the 2019-2020 House of Sparky end of year celebration competition over Zoom with friends, smiling, having fun, and now having a winner, the final edition name. Andrew, and now with that, with the win, you get a little 30-second rant, whatever it is you want. We've heard from you a lot, but still, I know there's a lot to say in that head on. Yeah, uh, my 30-second rant here, I could talk about ASU sports, um, athletics. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to talk about the team that we have here at House of Sparky. Wow. I wanted to take my 30 seconds. I mean this. Thank the family. Give a shout-out to everyone on the Zoom, all of our video people who have helped this year. Um, even our my other managing editor, uh, Brady Vernon, who isn't on this call. He's a interesting guy. I wish we had him on this call because he'd probably – Blow the conversation a little bit with his O's and his monotone voice, but I'm going to give a shout out to the whole House of Sparky team. It's a real team effort and uh, going to throw a shot here because I have to. It's on my last 30 seconds. Um, similar to the San Jose Sharks coming back against the Vegas Knights last year, it's a full team that has to come together um, to pull out a victory like in a game seven like that. So that's my 30 second rant. Appreciate everybody here. Um, and yeah, it's been a great year. Hopefully it uh, continues on. It's worth noting that Brady Vernon could not be on the show because he would get too fired up and scream too much at everybody here. So that's also, also worth noting, in case you're wondering, why is he bringing up the Sharks? I'm a San Jose native, Madden's a Vegas native, so just had to throw that shot in there. So that's my rant, Scotty. Thanks for and ending it with a shot. Hey, to all of you, thank you so much, Matt and Sebastian, Jacob and Andrew. This was something that we have never done before. It's great to see all of your beautiful faces. We haven't spoken in a couple weeks or months or uh, – for all at least together so it was really fun for me so I appreciate you being a part of it and what was also really fun for all Sun Devil fans was amazing moments that we got to witness all school year long from 2019 to 2020 and beyond and those will continue but for right now to end the show and end the season here uh, on this House of Sparky digital show for the end of your celebration here are the top five moments of the school year. Coming in at number five, Sun Devil goalie Evan DeBrower. That's one, that's two, that's three. Well, there was 44 of them in total. 44 collective saves to keep ASU stuck at a 2-2 tie against top-rated Denver. That face will tell you everything you need to know about DeBrower's performance. Number four, deep ball. Everybody loves a walk-off, including Kendra Hackbarth, apparently. Two strikes, two outs, down by one, a runner on, and Hackbarth goes yard to give Temp ASU a 6-5 win over Northwestern in the Valley of the Sun. Number three, Jaden Daniels down three points with under 40 seconds to go. You might call it a spin, a hurdle, a hop, or a dive. I call it a touchdown. ASU takes down Washington State on one of the coolest plays we've ever seen in Tempe. Jaden Daniels and the Devils, number three. Number two, how can you forget about this? Zoe Verge, the lay-in to beat Arizona. The Devils come back from 22 points down and win Territorial Cup matchup number two in Tempe. And the top play of the season of the 2019-2020 school year for ASU. Deep ball, Daniels to Ayuk, taking down number six, Oregon, and kicking them out of college football playoff hopes. An amazing year for ASU, and thanks for following along.